So why are we putting this much effort and paying this much price to travel, to preach about marriage and about relationships, about love? Why? The reason is simple. Because marriages matter. Family life matters. Is somebody get what I'm saying? I know black life matters. I know white lives matter. But marriages matter. Families matter. God has always intended to disciple the earth one family at a time. That has always been God's plan. Family has always been God's original plan. To disciple the earth one family at a time. When God created the earth, the first institution he set up was family. That's the first thing he set up. And if you know anything about Bible interpretation, every first in scripture matters. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? The first time they introduce a person or introduce a practice or introduce a pattern matters, okay? The first time they introduce a person, first time they introduce a pattern, first time they introduce a principle, first time they introduce anything like that matters. For instance, the first time they introduced God, one of the things they said is that in the beginning, God created. If you remove that fact, every other thing is an argument. If we can agree that God created the earth, then we can submit to other principles concerning God. But if we think the earth started by itself, then the Bible is useless to us. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So every time they introduce a person first, a principle first, a practice first, or a pattern first, matters. And when God set up the earth, the first thing he set up as an institution was family. First thing he made Adam to be was a husband and a father. If God felt education would change this world, he would have made Adam a professor. If God felt politics would change this world, he would have made Adam a prime minister or a president. If God even felt church would change this world, he would have made Adam a pastor. The first thing he made Adam was a husband and a father. I've been a pastor for close to 30 years. I love church. I'm a church person. I can't even remember my life without church because 30 years is a long time. But God began to show me that family even comes before church. Church is a backup plan to family. Church is just another imitation of family. That's why when Jesus came, he said, from now on, call God your father. It was a setup to just reintroduce family since the first family failed. In fact, the criteria to be a pastor is to run your home well. That's what the book of Timothy says. That one of the conditions or criteria for somebody to say they want to come and run God's family is that they should run their own family. If you can't run your own family, don't come and run God's family. Are you getting what I'm saying? And even COVID confirmed to us how important family is because everything was shut down during COVID. They shut down airlines, shut down business, shut down schools, even shut down church. Only one thing could not be shut down. Family. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So that is why we push this hard. Because if more families can get it right, the society will be better. If more families can get it right. And unfortunately or, you know, incidentally or anyhow you want to put it, somehow life just distracts us from the things that matters. We kind of want to hustle and focus on other things except the thing that really matters. If we can understand that really, and, and it, it, um, Harvard did a study, some of you must have seen this, Harvard did a study that has lasted close to 100 years, and what Harvard found out was that the one thing that impacts a human being's life the most is relationships. That is not the degree they have, not the location they, they, they stay in, not, the, not any other thing, not the amount of money they have, that the, the one thing that impacts human beings the most is relationships. And the chief of all relationships, of course, is family. It took Harvard 100 years to find that out. I could have found that out from scripture. But I'm happy science is catching up to scripture. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Took them 100 years. Some people studied millionaires, studied very successful people, and they found out that one of the most important things to your success is who you marry. They said 90% of your success is informed by who you marry, 
So, you see, everybody's coming around to find out that family and relationships are important. But unfortunately, somehow, that's the thing we all don't pay attention to. I always, always say, why do we have successful doctors that have unsuccessful marriages? Why do we have successful lawyers that have unsuccessful marriages? It's very simple. The lawyer has spent seven years studying law. The doctor has spent six or seven years studying medicine, but zero years studying marriage. That successful doctor that has an unsuccessful marriage, go to his library, you'll see many medical books. But ask him, how many marital books does he have and has he read? Him, he usually will have a mentor or a professor or someone that inspires him medically. Now ask him, do you have anybody that inspires you or mentors you maritally? And you see, when you check the, 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 these things, you find out we shouldn't be surprised he's succeeding in his medical field and not succeeding in marriage. People come to me all the time and say, Pastor, I'm unlucky with love. I say, nobody's unlucky with love. You might be uninformed, unlearned, uninvolved, uninterested, but not unlucky. Because if you give attention to what matters, you will succeed. So I always say, where you invest is where you harvest. Is somebody getting this? Where you invest is where you what? Harvest. This is why we travel with books. If I don't succeed in anything on this tour, one thing I want to leave you with is a desire to learn more about marriage. If I can leave you with that or leave that in you, I would have been successful on this tour. Because I'm not going to teach you everything you need to know today. Even if I stay here for 10 hours, I won't finish. But if I leave you with a hunger and a desire to make up your mind and make a commitment that I'll keep learning about marriage, do I learn about my career, do I learn about money, I also learn about marriage. Because this is the thing that will affect the rest. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? We somehow don't pay attention to learning. We somehow do not pay attention to learning. That is why we have so many books. We, we take our books everywhere. We, we, we encourage people to buy books, not because we just want to sell books, but because the desire to learn is crucial to succeeding in marriage. If we can pay attention. Some years ago, as a five or six years ago, they found out that nine out of the ten richest men in the world were divorced. Nine out of ten. That's almost a hundred percent. And I said, for you to be among the richest men in the world, you can't be foolish. You can't be lazy. If you're among the richest men in the world, nine out of ten, top ten richest people in the world, you, you are almost at genius level. You can't be a foolish person. But why are they failing in marriage? It's not because they are lazy or unintelligent. It's just because they are uninterested. Do you know how many documents you have to read if you are in the top 10 richest men in the world? Do you know how many things you sign? You don't even have a lawyer. You have a legal team. <laughs> the legal team, they are in a full building. They are not in an office. They are in a building. Because if you are among the richest men in the world, you are a suing target. People can sue you for anything. That the way you smiled at me, I had an accident. Let's go to court. And it's going to be cheaper for you to settle out of court than to, than to get that whole building to defend that case because you're going to pay those people. Is somebody get what I'm saying? So you are reading documents every day. Do you know how many meetings you have to be in if you are in the top 10 richest men in the world? Can you figure out how many meetings? Some of you here are not even the richest man on your street, but you are in meetings every time. You know how many meetings you attend? Especially those of you that are in tech. You are in two meetings in two parts of the world at the same time. You are muting one to talking one. <laughs> you know yourself, tech guys. <laughs> it's not about getting what I'm saying. So picture the richest man in the world. How many meetings he has to be in. If he's not in a meeting, then he's in a meeting planning for the next meeting. But why are these people failing in marriage? Structure just pushes us to focus on smaller things. As if they are the big things. Look at all of you here. Most of you flew thousands of miles from a country, spent thousands of pounds or euros or whatever to come here to study, to live, to work, because you believe coming here will give you access to a better life. But that's not what the start says. The start says to get a better life, do relationships right. You left the comfort of your, okay, sorry, there's no comfort. You left your country. <laughs> there's no comfort, sorry. <laughs> you, are, you are me, no, there's no comfort. You left your country. 
In fact, you like the discomfort of your country. <laughs> you flew all the way here. <laughs> Praise God. You flew all the way here to get a better life. Well, I have news for you. If you really want a better life, start to learn about marriage and relationship. That's a faster route to a better life. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? How many people here have been to Dubai before? Have you been to Dubai before? Thank you. The other people, have you heard about Dubai before? <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. I've been to Dubai in my lifetime up to 30 times. I love Dubai. I've gone there to preach, gone there to rest, gone there for work. I love Dubai. One of my favorite cities. I actually do power bike riding in Dubai. Dubai, most of you know Dubai's story. It started as a desert, and today, Dubai as a city has broken over 400 world records as a city. Most of those records are Guinness Book of Records. From a desert, the king of Dubai is divorced five times. You know you have to be a genius to turn a desert to a city that has broken this much records. I mean, your mind has, has to be above normal. Am I correct? I'm mentioning very intelligent people that are intelligent probably more than me and you that are failing in marriage. So it's not fools that fail in marriage. That's what I'm trying to say. It's just people that don't pay attention. Those are the people that fail in marriage. People that never take this kind of thing seriously. They will never come for meetings like this. They will go and watch a match. They will go for a concert. They won't come for meetings like this. They say, what is there? What are they teaching in marriage? <laughs> in fact, I still read something today somewhere. Somebody says, there is no art or science to marriage. What? And these are intelligent people. These are intelligent people. They are successful in their career. And they have the audacity, the effrontery, to say there is no art and, or science or there are no rules to love or relationship. The whole Bible is full of rules to succeed in everything in life, especially marriage. Did somebody get what I'm saying? Everything has rules to it. This is why we all never get the same results. Check in your class. There are people that are always at the top of the class, and there are people that are always at the bottom of the class. Am I correct? So it's like me, like me, oh, there are no rules to succeed in this class. We are just at the back because we sit at the back. <laughs> would, would that make any sense? There are always, in any society, there are always those at the top of the society that are the rich. There are always those that are really at the bottom. So it's like somebody also comes to say, there are no rules to succeeding and being rich in life. These people living on this side are just a lucky bunch. These ones here are the unlock. That's such a stupid thing to say. Life is not run by luck. There are rules to love. There, there are rules to marriage. And they're all Bible-based, science-backed, statistically proven. And I'll give you as much as I can give you today. The others you will get from the books and other mediums that are held. So, first thing we want to talk about today, we'll cover as much as we can. We'll talk about being the right person, choosing the right person, choosing that person for the right reasons, doing marriage right, because there are rules. I hear that all the time, that you don't even need, you don't even need a counselor. You don't need any marital advice. I said, that in itself is an advice. That thing you just said <laughs> is an advice. So you are already contradicting yourself. Don't need anybody to tell you, but you are already telling us something about marriage. Even though it's the wrong thing. The best sports people in the world still have coaches. Lena Mercy still has a coach. Djokovic still has a coach. Are you getting what I'm saying? So let's start. The first step is starting by being the right person. Being the right person. You see, the right person cannot find the right person. And let me say, the wrong person cannot find the right person. Many people are focused on finding the right person instead of focusing on being the right person. I have a book here titled, When Am I Ready? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Ah, how will I paint this picture? Who has lived in, in the UK... As you were not born here, but you have lived here for 10 years and upward. You have lived here for 10 years and upward. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll use you as an example. The decisions you would have made before you came to the UK 
Can you compare it to decisions you can make, you make now that you have lived here 10 years? Are they, are they going to be the same level? Never! Living here for 10 years, there are things you know now that somebody at home can't advise you about. That's never been here. He says, no, I think you should buy a house. He doesn't, he has not been here. Now, the person that got here 10 months ago, is, there, is it likely that he will be able to direct you on how to live here? You'd have stayed here 10 years now. No! So, what I'm saying is that who you are determines the quality of decisions you make. So, the first step is not looking for the right person. The first step is being the right person. No matter how you try to help someone that is not yet the right person, you can't help them. The worst thing you can do is to be giving advice to somebody that is not, he won't even value your advice. There are many of you who passed up good opportunities because you were not in the state of mind to even see that thing as an opportunity. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. Oh man, I can't count how many times in my life I've passed up good real estate opportunities. I met, I mean, my, my uncle came to visit me in my house and he said, when he saw the estate, now, my, I, lived, I lived in an estate, beautiful estate, beautiful estate, all low fences, street lights, you know, everything beautiful. And the guy said, wow. He said he came here about 20 years or 15 years ago and somebody showed him this land, it was a swamp. He said, who is going to buy a swamp? He said, he's not going to buy, he left. He came back, somebody else saw an estate where he saw a swamp. Oh, I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. That person you think you can't marry, somebody else will nested there. Hey, I'm telling you, are you getting what I'm saying? There are some of you, when you get married, you will go and thank your ex. Because he never saw anything good in you. I mean, there are people you have dated, they always had something bad to say, and you meet somebody else, you always have something good to say. Same person, because they are seen differently. Someone is seeing all your faults. The other person is seeing all your potential. So there's nothing wrong with you per se. It's about whether that person is the right person or not. When my wife tells me some things that the person she dated before used to say, that, the, that my wife said she never knew she was very smart. Now she knew she was not a dullard, but she never knew that she was. When I tell her, I'm like, I've never met a girl as smart as you. And you know, there's nothing, I mean, a woman is a bulldozer when her esteem is up. There's nothing she can't do. Man, if I have time, I'll coach you. I mean, there's a way to talk to a woman. If you get a woman excited, a woman can, can do things that even a hundred men can't do. When you boost up her self-esteem. I remember a story of, of a village where there was one lady that used to have hunchback. She looked so ugly. She used to couch like this. And the people were coming to that village to marry. In that village, where you want to marry, you bring a cow. And some other things they ask you to bring. So people were marrying all her mates, but she would never got married. And she married late. And one guy finally came and came to marry her. The guy brought 10 cows. Made a fuss about her. By the time she came back to the village, nobody could recognize her. People said, we thought you had hunchback. She said, no, she never had hunchback. She was just too insecure. When she met a man that made her feel she's more than what anybody could be, she began to walk upright. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Yeah. Most men don't know. Look, the, any woman that comes into your life, she has to be better in your hand than she was in her parents' hand. Her parents can have many of them as children, but you will have only her as your focus. You definitely have to do a better job than her parents have done. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? As a married man, your wife is your scorecard. When we look at her, she'll be able to know, we'll know whether you're a good husband or not. She has to be finer in your house than she was in her house. She has to be fresher in your house than she was in her house. She has to be happier in your house than she was in her house. You can't be married and your, your, your wife is missing home. <laughs> you're not doing a good job. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So it starts by you being the right person. I can't count how many opportunities we have missed because we saw a swamp where other people saw an estate. We saw a disadvantage where other people saw an advantage. Look out for anybody that is trying to change everything about you. 
I don't like the way you laugh. Change your laughter. <laughs> change your hair. Change your walk. Change your talk. Change your dress. My dear, just change your mind. <laughs> That's not the right person for you. You can't change everything about this person. And I'm telling you, there are people like that. They've come to me and said, Pastor, oh, tell this woman, I want her to change. You know, maybe he came from a church where ladies don't wear earrings, ladies don't wear, have hair, um, wigs, and things like that. And he went to a church where the ladies dress like that, and he wants him to change his lady to the ladies in his church. I said, marry from your church. <laughs> don't come and change this one, because you're going to change too many things about her. By the time you're done with her, she will lose herself. Watch out for anybody that wants to totally change everything about you. And when I mean change, I don't mean changing for the better. Just changing to a different thing. You know, there's change for better. There's change for just change. I don't like the way you talk. When some people marry, I wonder, so why did you now pick this person? Say, oh, she doesn't agree with anything I say at all. So on what basis did you pick her? What did you pick? So this book here is titled, When Am I Ready? I dealt with some things that helps you to know if you are ready. You are not ready when you are lonely. Oh, somebody's not getting what I'm saying. It's not loneliness that makes you ready. Because there are many men and women desperately praying now that, oh, I'm so ready. <laughs> Just because you are ready for sex doesn't mean you are ready for marriage. Oh, maybe I'm talking to the wrong crowd this evening. I said, just because you are ready for sex doesn't mean you are ready for marriage. They are two different things. Getting along is better than getting aroused. Some people are just ready for sex. They're not ready for marriage. Because being ready for marriage is a different ball game. I always jokingly say, by their dance, you shall know them. The way some people dance during their wedding, you know they have no clue. <laughs> they have no clue what they are going for. <laughs> this can't be the body language of somebody that knows what they are going for. Because marriage is like war. Marriage is a, it's a call to service. It's a call to die. Marriage is a call to die. Nobody that has been chosen to go and die dances like that. <laughs> even Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that his own death was going to change the world, that he was even well prepared for his own death. When he got there, he said, if it be possible, <laughs> let this cup pass over me. Let me escape this death. Nobody that Marriage is a call to death. I will tell you, in scripture, because what happens in marriage is that two people come as individuals, they both die at the altar and they resurrect as one person. That being called John, called Jane, will no longer exist when you come to the altar. Because a new being is about to resurrect. It's a call to death. Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible said, Husbands, you know, love your wives. Like Christ loved the church and they were specific and he gave himself for her. Meaning he died for his own bride. You too be ready to die for, for your bride. Called to death. Where do women die? Very simple. The woman already from day one is coming to die because her assignment is that she must be submitted and yielded to this man. And women, let me tell you why it's death. Because naturally you are way more complex and sophisticated than a man. And God has asked you to follow <laughs> someone way slower than you. You will die. <laughs> That's why a lot of women are frustrated. Because they are following somebody that... Women don't understand when men want to go and think about something. You know, when the woman is talking to a man, he will say, I want to go and think about it. She doesn't understand. She says, so as you're standing here, you're not thinking. <laughs> because his brain is slower. Men think deeper, but slower. Women think on their feet. As women are talking, they are thinking. I like to cancel women. If you cancel women, they tell you the problem, they also tell you the solution. <laughs> and they now pay you. I love my job. Women think on their feet. 
as they are talking, they are thinking. So they always find it surprising when they tell a man an idea. They are very excited. Look, oh, honey, I think, I think, I think. And the only response the man is saying is that, I want to go and think. <laughs> because his brain is slower. So it starts by being the right person. It's a call to death. I came from a military family. Um, my eldest brother, we, we have, number one, we have five boys. We all went to military school. My eldest brother is a retired major general, my, our firstborn, five boys, retired major general. My mother also was in the army. So we're very military. And so I've seen people posted to war. I've never seen anywhere they post a soldier to war. As into a real war zone, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, real war zone, and the soldier is dancing. <laughs> Afga, Afghanistan. <laughs> So when I see the way some brides and grooms dance, I say, these guys don't know they are going to die. <laughs> On our wedding day, my wife was shaking, literally shaking. The priest had to tell her, if you don't stop shaking, I will stop the wedding. Because she said she knew that, number one, her life will never be the same. Life as she knew it is going to end today, where her parents always took care of her, where she could decide what she wanted to do with her life. That from today, she's submitting her whole life Put things in the hand of another man. And it can wreck you. So she knew what she was getting into. That's somehow, sometimes how you know people that are going to make it. They understand the seriousness of the day. Some women think the marriage is about them. That's what they think. They think, oh, he's going to be hugging me. <laughs> He'll be giving me flowers. He'll tell me all these sweet things. Wow. That's why there are so many unhappy women in marriage. So many. Because they have unmet expectations. Expectations that nobody put on them. They created the expectations by themselves. <laughs> women, you guys cooperate for the wrong things. Because women worldwide just set up things. You know now, if you propose to a woman without a ring, she'll be upset. She can die. <laughs> you propose without a ring? Please, which constitution or which scripture? Say so you must suppose you ring. I'm not saying you should not, I'm saying, look, there are many things you guys built up by yourself that has become a bondage to you. Many things you've set as standard. He's going to be telling me the right things. You are clueless. Because that man doesn't understand you. It will take the average man about 10 years in marriage to mature into his roles in marriage. About 10 years. Because he, except he has married before. <laughs> if this is his first attempt, he's, you are too complex. You are so different. He's not going to know what to say. He doesn't understand that women speak in parables. Women, you know you don't speak English. <laughs> oh, women speak in parables. Men are literal beings. If a man says, leave me, he means leave me. If a woman says, leave me, she means hold me. Show me you don't want to leave me. Confusing for the average guy. If, the, if, I, if a man says, I'm leaving you, trust me, he has already thought of where he's going. He has a place, he has already done the calculations. He has called people. If a woman says, I'm leaving you, I'm leaving. Most of them have not thought of where they are going. Because they are not actually planning to leave. They'll be on the, it's on the way, they'll be thinking, where am I going now? <laughs> so I coach men that you must understand how women talk. They are not literal beings. If a woman says, you don't love me. For a woman, that, that's a question. It's not a statement. But men, don't, the average man can't understand that. He thinks he's a literal being. He thinks it's a statement. You don't love me. He would think it's a call to debate. You say, good afternoon, accurate timekeepers. <laughs> Fellow debaters and my ever faithful judges, I'm here to defend the motion or to resist the motion that I don't love her. Say, three years ago, your sister got married and I traveled to attend the wedding. Last week, you said you needed new pairs of shoes and I bought it for you. I hope with these few words of mine, I've been able to convince you and not convince you. Confuse you. He thinks it's a call to debate. No, when a woman says you don't love me, it's a question. The question is, do you love me? 
So the real thing you're supposed to do is to affirm her and say, hey, baby, you know I love you. Sometimes a hug will go better than any sentence. But men don't know that. It's a literal being. You don't love me. It's a call to debate. He wears his debating club cap. <laughs> a lot of times when men argue with women, at the end of the day, they don't even know what the argument was about. Because women and men are not, they are not speaking. They might be doing the same activity, but for different reasons. When a man and a woman comes together, the man wants to mate. The woman wants a mate. The man is thinking of the short-term project. The woman is thinking of long. A wedding day for a man is the end of something. For the woman is the beginning of something. They are both dancing for different reasons. Because a man is a project-minded being. For him, project starts and ends. From the day he's toasting you, you are the project. And because he's one-track-minded, he's giving you 100% attention, calling you morning after night. The woman thinks this is how it's going to be. I like this guy. He's calling me. We even pray together in the morning. He's the first person to chat with me and the last person to chat every day. Ladies, enjoy that while it lasts. From the moment you say yes or you agree, in his mind, project completed. And he moves to another project. So you find out from when you agree to marry a man or sleep with him or whatever you, you don't, when he gives a conclusion, his level of motivation drops incredibly. Even he can't explain it sometimes if he's not knowledgeable. He doesn't know why suddenly the urge to call you as he used to. Now you hear things like he's busy. I'm in a meeting. He was always busy before. Just that you were the project. I explained some of this in the book called Manual, The Way Men Think. Because women were always asking me, Pastor, why do men? Why do men? So I had to write a book, a manual for women, to understand how men think. They are project driven. So once he has reached a conclusion, naturally, instinctively, he doesn't know why. He just moves to something else. So he doesn't give you as much attention. And the woman is distraught. She's doing everything. And for, for you know, she starts competing with his next project. I tell women, don't do that. Instead, compliment his next project. Find out what the next project is and be a part of it. Then he sees you. The moment you compete with his next project, you become a distraction. He relates you as stress. He starts avoiding you. And this is how many married couples live. Some men stay late at work, not because they have more work. They are avoiding the distraction at home. And she thinks, if you don't talk to me willingly, I will nag you till you talk to me. So what she's doing is making him distance himself more. Making him log out more. Many times when a man is nodding and looking at you, he's not listening to you. He's saying, when will this trouble end? And for many men, one day they will, they will structure when it will end. A man is a project-driven person. So on the wedding day when you're dancing, he's dancing that, oh, finally, I've finished this project. I can face my real estate business. The woman is dancing, oh, finally, I'm married. We can begin our life together. She's seen it as the beginning. He's seen it as the end. So number one step is be the right person. Be the right person. Age-wise, be the right person. I know there are not so many young people here, but please, statistically, there's a good age to get married. Don't get married when you are in your teens. Don't even get married early 20s, like 21, 20. Allow your life to... See, when you get married, your life will never be the same. There are some years that are meant to be for you. Because you will never have that kind of exclusivity again. Some people don't know this. There are some years that... The only, these are the only years you have to focus on you. And these are your teenage years and the early 20s, 21, 22, 23, if possible sometimes. Focus on you, your career, your vision, where you are going, your spiritual life. Focus a bit on you. You also mature at those ages. That's why, have you noticed? There's an age the whole country agrees that you are not smart enough to vote. They say, we don't trust you, you are foolish. <laughs> at this age, you can't choose a president. And nobody argues with that. There's an age they say you can't drink. We, can't, we don't trust you to be responsible. You know that I drink responsibly? It's from, there's an age. There's an age of irresponsibility. They say, oh, you, you can't drive at a certain age. You can't drink at a certain age. You can't vote at a certain age. But people think you can fall in love at any age. No. Because there's what is called maturity. Even though maturity can't be determined by age, but there's usually an age range we know you are not mature. 
So statistically, they found out the earlier people marry, the more likely to end in divorce. That the older, the better. Now, I'm not saying you should wait till you are too old. I'm just saying what the statistics says. 1920, a lot of them either will marry more than once, or even if they are in a marriage, most of them are not happy in it. Because your life still changes so much at that age. When you are 19, 20, you can fall in love with someone because of their hairstyle. When you are 29, you fall in love because of their lifestyle. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So, basically, I'm saying, get this book. I, I dealt with all those things. What maturity is spiritually, mentally, physically, and all those things. The baseline is, first, be the right person. Secondly, choose the right person. When it comes to marriage, one of the most important things is who you do the marriage with. Not the prayer. Some people want to pray their way into success. Oh, I'm a man of prayer. I believe in prayer. But have you noticed certain countries never win the World Cup? <laughs> and they pray more than the countries that win the World Cup. Have you noticed? I don't know what country you are from, but I'm from Nigeria. We always pray in the stadium, on the field. In the day of the match, you see the 11 players, they gather together and they pray. We all know they're not going to win. <laughs> because people that are going to win, they have the right team, the right coach, the right training. You can't win that day by prayer. If it's by prayer, then our squad will be different. We'll bring Kirk Franklin. <laughs> bring Nathan Ebasi. Bring Ducey. Bring all our worship. If it's by prayer, who will just pray and shake the place by fire? <laughs> but you notice the guys that win might not even pray that day, but they have the right squad. They have the right squad. Very important. I did a post one time on my page, and this is where Christians need to be wiser. I did a post, and somebody came to a uh, post was about David and how you know he killed Goliath. And somebody came and said, no, it was about um, learning, rather. And the person came and said, um, it's not skill that matters, it's the anointing that David could kill Goliath by the anointing. I said, which Bible are you reading? <laughs> the anointing only came on an area where David was already skilled. Yeah. Christians need to know that the anointing doesn't work in isolation. The anointing always comes on the area of your skill. If you want to be a real estate mogul, a real estate billionaire, you have to learn the ropes. Then the anointing comes to guide you. But not that you know nothing. And you say, I depend on the anointing. You are going to be an anointed failure. <laughs> David killed Goliath with the slingshot. He was already an expert at using the slingshot. In fact, they tried to give him armor of Saul. He said, I don't have any skill in using armor. So if it was the anointing, he didn't even need armor or slingshot. He would have just gone there and killed. No, he needed to use the area he was killed. When God when Jesus wanted to pay tax, Peter was the only person there. He didn't say, go and build a stool and sell a stool. He said, go to fish. My anointing will work in the area you are skilled. He said, go and catch fish. Fisher, Peter was a fisherman. Imagine if you want to fly from here to London, and you open the cockpit, you enter the plane, and you see me there <laughs> as the pilot. And you say, Pastor K, do you, have you gone to any pilot school? I said, no. <laughs> but the anointing will take us there. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you will continue with the flight? <laughs> you see, so that's how funny the things we say in church looks. The anointing works on the area of a skill. Now, if, if I went to proper pilot school, I'm a good pilot, and there's a there's trouble on the air, I'll be happy to have an anointed trained pilot because he has an advantage over just an ordinary trained pilot. Do you see the difference? So you need to understand how these things work. So the, the quality of person you pick to marry goes a long way. And unfortunately, over the years of doing counseling, I've found out that many people genuinely do not know how to pick. 99% of the marriages I've counseled that has failed. One of the major problems is that the foundation was faulty. I have a book here titled 25 Wrong Reasons People Enter Relationships. <clears throat> and I always say if you enter the relationship for the wrong reason, 
you have most likely entered with the wrong person. If you enter for sex, then what you need is a woman that has shape. What you need is a sexy woman. But that's not going to make marriage work. Getting along is always better than getting aroused. Are you here, somebody? Marrying for the wrong reason. If you marry just for money, you would have made a permanent decision based on a temporary breakthrough. One of my boys came to me many years ago and said, Pastor, I'm getting married. I said, how come? Oh, we never discussed this before. He said, there's a lady that's been chasing me from college, from secondary school, but I've been running away from her. But she just called me now that she made one million naira. <laughs> Those days, one million naira was still a lot of money. Now it's like 100 pounds or 200 pounds. <laughs> okay, 250 pounds. <laughs> Praise God. He said, if, if I can confirm that he has, she has really made one million naira, I will marry her. I said, by the time you book wedding hall, rent a house, and buy a wedding gown, you would have finished that money. You would have made a permanent decision because of a temporary breakthrough. A book like this will help you censor your motives to know why you are marrying someone. I shared a story in my church some, years, some time ago, how that when I was a young preacher, very broke young preacher, you know, women don't know that men are very transactional with their love. Men want to get ahead in life. Success and work is more important to men than marriage. Ladies don't know this. Ladies think all of us love marriage. No. A man's first love is always work. The first thing they gave Adam was work before they gave him wife. So he likes work. The first thing they gave Eve was wife before they gave her work. I mean husband. So women always like marriage. Women are family oriented. Men are work oriented. A man will gladly leave his family to another city to work. A woman will gladly leave her work to another city to her family. Women always like work. Family. Men always like work. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Even when they ate the fruit, when God was going to tell them about the consequences, he spoke to the man about work. He said, from now you will sweat to eat. For the woman, he didn't tell her about work. He just said that from now you will have issues with choosing a husband and you're in childbirth you will have issues. Family. So you will never see in scripture God talk to men and women the same about marriage. Never. Always talks to them differently because they are different beings, different interests. When people meet 10 years after school, if it's guys, they ask themselves, where, where do you work now? When ladies meet 10 years after school, they ask themselves, are you married now? <laughs> Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So they are different beings. So you need to understand that men are transactional, so they're always looking for how to get ahead in life. So, so when I was a young preacher, broke young preacher, just starting life, oh, there was this lady in our church. Her parents were rich, and even she was rich. She was in some form of business, and she was making money in the millions. And she liked me. I mean, who won't? <laughs> <laughs> I used to be finer than this, though. <laughs> it's the traveling that has made me add weight like this. I used to be very cute when I was young, praise God. <laughs> so young preacher, fine boy, anointed, cool guy. The girl liked me. I was going to marry into millions. But I had to get to a stage where I needed to be honest with myself and say, if this lady didn't have money, would I normally want to marry her? It takes brutal honesty. Because your mind can play tricks on you. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. Who can know it? There are many people that say, I'm in love, I'm in love. It's a passport you love. Not the person in the passport. Oh, I'm preaching to the wrong audience. Let me go this way. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? <laughs> you have to be honest. What exactly are you marrying? Because after you get the passport, you have to live with the passport owner. People never think that far. And you're not going to live with them for one week. Not for one month. Not for one year. Tentatively for the rest of your life. Even if you have an exit plan, you might have kids together. When you have kids together, you never divorce. You can only separate when you have kids together. You never divorce. Because you have something joining two of you together. On paper, you can be divorced, but in life, you are not. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So I had to be brutally honest with myself. So a book like this will help you. I dealt with 25 wrong reasons. There are so many. Some people are not married because all their mates are married. Wrong mindset. There is no mates in life. Every race is an individual race. Are you here, somebody? Some people want to marry because winter is coming. You are not Game of Thrones. 
So 25 wrong reasons people enter relationships will help you. Praise God. Another book here is titled, Who Should I Marry? Hmm. Who Should I Marry? Again, in my interviewing young people, I found that most of them genuinely do not have a list of who they want in marriage. Most of them do not. The average young person has not been able to separate their needs from their wants. When you ask people to write what they want in a marriage, they are writing their wants. Because the needs are like vegetables. The wants is like chocolate. One appears sweeter, but has no real bearing in your health long term. The other one might not taste so good, but long term you will value it. You ask every young girl, what do you want in a man you want to marry? You hear she must, he must be tall, <laughs> dark, handsome. Have you seen any couple that has been married for 10, 20 years successfully, and you ask them what's the secret of your marriage, and you say, ah! My husband's height. <laughs> height has no bearing in long-term success in marriage. No bearing. It's just a want that looks good on paper and on picture. But in reality, you rather have a tolerant man than a tall man. Tolerant is more important. Tolerant is a need. Tall is a want. You must separate the two. You would rather have, instead of having a fine man, a faithful man. I've never seen any couple come to divorce and say, why are you divorcing? My husband is not fine again. <laughs> what I hear is that he's not faithful. So what you actually want is a faithful man, not a fine man. A faithful man is a need. A fine man is a want. Are you getting what I'm saying? So most young people, separate your needs from your wants. Wants are not bad, but you need to know that they are secondary. Your needs are the non-negotiables. For many young people, they, 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 they make the negotiables to be non-negotiables. They did not make the non-negotiables to be negotiable. His character must come first. Are you getting what I'm saying? Many of you have filled your mind with physical image of how the man you want to marry needs to look. No, instead, change it to the internal images. Because the real person you're going to marry might not, most times will not fit your physical image. It won't. Because the man you are creating doesn't yet exist. What you need to focus on is how he looks internally. That's the one you should be rigid on. You are focusing on things that you should be flexible on. Fine man. Which man is not fine? Have you seen a billionaire that is not fine? <laughs> I've not seen a billionaire that women are not chasing. I've not seen. So, I even see ladies say, I can't marry someone that is not a graduate. No. What you mean is that you can't marry someone you are intellectually compatible with. That's what you really want. Not a graduate. Paper. Graduate is paper. There are a lot of graduates you can't, you can't have the same conversation with. There are a lot of degree holders. You can't even stand them for five minutes with the way they think. I don't know if you have met these people before. <laughs> Ten minutes, you hear how they think, how they reason. You wonder, are you even a human being? <laughs> because their thought pattern is so far from how any civilized person should think. Are you getting what I'm saying? So what you really want is somebody you are mentally compatible with, not a degree holder. Somebody that has a future, because that's what a degree means. A degree means, does it have a future financially? There are many people without a physical degree that are doing well, may way better than those with 10 degrees. Some people have more degrees than a thermometer. <laughs> and they're still very broke. If you say you can't marry someone without a degree, that means you're going to marry the Mark Zuckerberg and the Bill Gates and the Michael Dell and all these guys have shaped the tech world. Of course, they didn't have a degree when they started. When I got married to my wife, she had a master's degree. I had OND. You know OND? O stands for ordinary. <laughs> N is national. That national was Nigeria. When something is ordinary in Nigeria, it's not a good thing. <laughs> but she had a master's degree. So ordinarily you will think, oh, yeah, her mindset might, no, 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 ask her. She married a highly intelligent guy. Highly. <laughs> so if you stay on the, on the wrong things like that, you will miss a lot of good people. You must always give people a chance to present their case. Don't judge from afar. He's not tall enough. Talk to him. He might be tolerant enough for your bad behavior. Are you here, somebody? He might be the only one that can stand you. 
He must be tall. Even you that can't cook. <laughs> he might be the only one that can tolerate your bad cooking. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So, know how to pick. Who should I marry? I mentioned 10 C's in this book. Number one C, the person must be in Christ. If you're a believer, please marry another believer. Oh, being, being a believer is not just church going. It's a transformed life. If you have truly been transformed by Christ, then you should be able to tell there was a difference between who you were before Christ and who you are now after Christ. I knew who I was before I got saved, so I can, there's no way I can marry an unbeliever. I was a, I was a, I was a weed smoking, beer guzzling, pistol carrying, money stealing, prostitute patronizing, gangster before I got saved. So now I've been transformed totally. There's no way I'm going to find an unbeliever attractive. Because understand what God took me out from. When two people get married, they become one. If you are a believer and you want to marry an unbeliever, two of you can never be one. Because you can be one physically, you can have sex. You can be one mentally, you can agree on some basics. But spiritually, it's not even in attendance. Because the Bible says you were once dead in trespasses and in sins. When someone is not born again, they are spiritually dead. They are not in attendance at all. God told my wife many years ago, he said, can you go to the mortuary or cemetery to pick a spouse? Even if they are nice. Even if they are rich. She said, no, they are dead. God said, exactly. When you are not born again, you are a dead person spiritually. We were all dead. If you are, we were born again now, but there was a time you were dead in trespasses and in sins. Ephesians chapter 2. They say, God raised you up. You can now go back to the dead to pick a life partner. When I get to the right purposes of marriage, you understand why as a believer, you can't marry an unbeliever. Say two cannot be on, you cannot be unequally yoked together. It's an unequal yoke. Say two can't work together, say they be agreed. You can't agree spiritually. Are you here, somebody? Because at the end of the day, what governs your life is your spiritual orientation. Cultures will always change. Trends will always change. But who you are spiritually matters. So number one, the person has to be in Christ. That's the first C I listed in this book. Please take note. I didn't say the person must go to church. Because not everybody that is in church that is in Christ. A church is a hospital. A good church attracts all kinds of people. So just because you met in church doesn't mean he's in Christ. Are you here, somebody? We always tell people, before you marry, please talk to the chief medical officer of the church. Every church is a hospital. The chief medical officer has the file of every patient. You say, sir, one of your patients, Mr. John, <laughs> is proposing marriage to me. And the chief medical officer will check his file. John, John, John. Yes, I know John. He joined this church three years ago. So he's not responding. <laughs> to <treatment. laughs> because some people in church are responding to treatment. Some are not responding. We're about to change his prescription. Because no matter how the things we've taught him, he has not changed. Still living the same way. So just because you met in church, sleeping in a garage doesn't make you a car. So because they go to church doesn't mean they're in Christ. So number one, the person has to be in Christ. Second quality, the person has to have Christ-like character. So character is the second C. When you marry a beautiful woman, you inherit her character. The character comes along with it. Because some people just want to marry for the beauty. No, the character comes along. What is their character like? Do they lie? Do they cheat? Do they steal? If they lie for you, they will lie to you. If they cheat with you, they will cheat on you. What is their character? Are they always quarrelsome? You guys, for one week, you can't have a meaningful conversation. You argue every day of the week. Again, when people tell me things like, oh, there are no rules, there are no laws, no. For instance, quarreling. They found out that if you have five negative conversations compared to one positive one, that marriage is not likely to work. Statistically proven. So when you say there are no rules, there are no laws, I laugh when people say those things. Where do you get it from? It's a full, what we do is a full career. It's a full profession. Everything has rules and laws and numbers and stats. If you are engaged or in a relationship and you guys have five negative conversations compared to one positive, in the ratio of one positive one, they say it will not make it. They also found out if you have 11 positive ones, straight with then one negative one, somebody's pretending. He said, that one too will not last. 
Somebody's scamming the other one. <laughs> Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So in a real relationship, we're not saying you will avoid conflict. We're just saying the way you are dealing with the issues is what matters more than the issues. Not that they will not, you are two human beings, so you are likely to see things from two different angles. You are even two different genders. So you are always going to see things differently. It's how we are dealing with those issues. Is somebody get what I'm saying? If we have to insult ourselves to get a way to go forward, something is wrong. If we have to slap each other, if we have to break somebody's windscreen or break somebody's television, or if somebody's all just pretending and saying, yes, ma, yes, sir, yes, yes, yes. Somebody's coming, somebody. Are you here, somebody? So second C is character. What's their behavior? Are we always quarreling? Are we always disagreeing on the important things? Are they people you can't trust? I've seen people say, oh, we're going to get married, but we'll never join our finances because I don't trust the person I want to marry. You must be kidding me. You don't trust them with your money, but you want to trust them with your life. That means you don't know what's, what's important in life. You want to trust them with your life, but you don't want to trust them with your money. You don't want to trust them with your money, but you want to trust them with your kids. You are a ritual killer. <laughs> yeah, because if I want to marry someone, I say, I can't give me my money, but take my children. That means you don't know what va what's valuable. If I can't trust you with my money, I can't also trust you with my kids. My kids are more valuable to me than my money. I can't even trust you with my life. Because who you marry is the first person that can kill you. It's the easiest. I hope you know this. I watch American crime channels a lot, especially the real ones, the real ones that they investigate the case. 99% of the time, when a married person dies, the number one suspect is their spouse. I, watch, I always love it. Nowadays, I'm, I'm so good at it that I can even be a detective now. <laughs> I've watched it so much. Once a married person dies, oh, the partner is crying. Oh, I can't believe my sweetheart is gone. Oh, my love is gone. Police say, oh, we are so sorry. We are so sorry. After you, you cry like this, that same day, oh, as you cry, as they pet you. They say, where were you by 2 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> you will think because of this crying, they will forget their work. They are there with barrel and paper. Where were you by 2 o'clock? He said, I was at work. Can you also have myself verify that? Because you are the number one suspect. I feel like cry and roll on the floor. And a lot of times, that person had a hand in it. That's the person somebody says, they, they hide their money. If you die, then what, what use the money you're hiding? Then you have a, something's wrong with your priority, sense of priority. I said this somewhere, and somebody said, ah, pastor, it's not true. I had one auntie, she was very old, and she was, going to, she was very rich, and she was going to get married, and all of us agreed she should do a prenup. She should keep her money. And truly, pastor, after they got married, less than two years, they were divorced. I said, all of you knew something was wrong. But you guys wanted her to marry by force. You all knew. By the time all of you come together and say, keep your money, you all knew this guy can't be trusted. The issue should have been keep your life. Because what if she died in it? Because we can't mention how many. Just these things don't make news. We can't mention how many people have lost their life or even lost their mind. Marrying someone they knew from day one that something was wrong. So character, second C. What's their character like? One of the saddest stories I share that has happened to me in my lifetime was many years ago when our church was still young. There was this guy, he was a giant, very tall, huge guy. He used to be a gangster in campus cult, campus cult in Nigeria. Some of you know what I'm talking about. He used to be one of the hit men. Huge, giant, very dreaded, bold guy, rugged. They used to send him from campus to campus to go and hit people, main people, cutlass, machete, stuff like that. Huge hit man. And he now got born again. He came to our church, got born again in our church. This giant became a gentle giant. This cult guy, Hitman, became a Bible carrying, tongue talking, tight paying, church attending, hallelujah, shouting believer. He got so transformed, he was now teaching in believers' class, teaching young believers, ministering the Holy Ghost. Totally transformed life. And he was so now, he was now very blessed financially as he began to work with the Lord. The guy used to pay tight every week, sizable amount. If the guy makes a pledge on a Sunday for a project, Monday morning, without fail, in cash, he has brought the pledge. The guy used to come to my office to harass me and say, Pastor, you don't announce the needs of the church. Announce the needs of the church so that we can give. We want to give, but you're not saying anything. Ah, that's every pastor's dream. <laughs> because the average pastor is chasing people to give. Now you have somebody chasing you that, tell us what we can give. I said, man, you are the kind of people I'm looking for. <laughs> Where have you been all my life? While this was going on, this guy was a pillar in the church. A pillar in the church. On the other hand, there was another sister that was going through trauma. Now I know it was trauma. 
But then I didn't know it was trauma. I have a book entitled Heal Before You Deal. This is on that book everybody must read to make sure you're not carrying trauma into your marriage. There are many marriage counseling I've done. In the middle of it, I realized it wasn't a relationship problem. You see, my job is relationship counseling, not mental <laughs> problem counseling. There are many cases I've taken. In the middle of it, I realized that I'm talking to the wrong people. Because this is not a relationship thing. This is a trauma case. When you're dealing with somebody that has trauma, no matter who they marry, if you're, if you're, if you're dealing with a narcissist, even if you're an angel, they will frustrate the hell. So counseling is not going to help these people, except one of the, we deal with one of them, the real issues inside them. That's why trauma, see, that's why we call it, we heal before you deal. Please don't take your trauma. Your, your partner can't heal you. You need a professional. Many of you are bleeding on the person that didn't cut you. You are punishing your next for the crimes of your ex. Carrying trauma from somewhere. So, I didn't know it was trauma then. But she had issues. Her dad left her mom. And this is why we hate when people divorce. This is why God hates divorce. God doesn't hate the divorcee, but he hates divorce. Because there's too much collateral damage. If you want to leave your husband or what, that's why we try to get you to marry right in the first place. Because coming out of a marriage is going to hurt many people. The statistics are not good for people that come out of divorce, children that come out of divorce marriage. The statistics are not good. And this is not to condemn anybody. If you're coming from those kind of things, make sure you heal. Or else you carry the trauma from your parents' marriage into your own next marriage. Stats are not good for it. So please don't just divorce anyhow. Don't divorce carelessly. The damage is too much. So her dad left her mom, so she became very bitter and angry. So she was fighting her dad, fighting her mom, fighting her elder brother, fighting her boss, even fighting me, the pastor. She had a lot of trauma going on. She was a fighter. She will fight. She can't stay in a place and have peace for one week. I'm t- there are people that have all kinds of trauma issues that are not obvious. Do you know there are ladies that can never like a guy that chases them? Oh, I can give you cases, guys. If you're here and I mention things that look like you, go and get help. <laughs> no, no, it's not, I'm not saying it jokingly. There are a lot of ladies I've met, if a guy approaches them, if a guy makes the first move, they can never like the guy. They only like guys that they chase. And usually, they are chasing a guy that doesn't like them. And they're in that cycle. They've chased three men. None none stayed. And most times, because a man needs to be ready to marry before he chases you. This is why we like for men to do the chase. Women mature emotionally quicker than men. So if you chase a man, a man doesn't know what to do with you. Now that you have caught him. He doesn't know what to do. It's okay, you have caught me now. <laughs> what next? So he will start sleeping with you, spending your money, using you. That's all he knows. He has not yet matured enough to know what his job and role is as a husband. He will just use you and make a mess of you. That's all he knows to do. It's like giving an expensive toy to a boy. He's going to play with it and scatter it and dismember it. That's all he's going to do. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. But so the ladies like that, if you, if, even if you're the best man in the world, as long as you approach them, you chase them, psychologically, they can't like you. There are ladies that can never like people that are their age range. They are looking for their father. Their fa- I'm not joking, honestly, I'm not joking. Their father left early, so they are still on a quest for their father. So like way older men, 20 years and above age range. That's who they like. And you think it's real love. Most times, some of those things are not real love. It's just trauma. There are many other cases. So you, you need to find out. If you have any, if you have any weird behavior in your love life, you need to deal with it. <laughs> I'm telling you. There are so many of them. So this lady, this lady, um, you know, was fighting. She was a troublemaker, a fighter. We couldn't explain why she loved fight. She just loved to fight. And our church was so small. You know, if it's a big church and you're a troublemaker, it's in one corner you're making the trouble. But this girl was, you know, the church was small. So every time she caused tension, every Sunday there was tension. And you, the pastor, you didn't even know what to preach because there are two factions. If you preach anyhow, you, it means you're supporting the other people. <laughs> tension every Sunday. I said, look, this church is too small. We will never grow if there's this amount of trouble every Sunday. We will never grow. So I, I called my associate pastor. We held hands together and prayed the prayer of agreement. We said, Lord, send this girl to redeem. <laughs> I'm joking, I didn't say redeem. Because <laughs> some people have already hated me. I don't like this pastor again. 
redeem my first of all. No, I didn't say redeem. But we prayed and said, Lord, send this girl to another church. We, we can't handle it. We are too small. We'll never grow. And truly, two months after, <laughs> two months after, she came and said, Pastor, I've been sensing in my heart that God wants me to go to another church. <laughs> We're like, oh, <laughs> wow, are you sure? And she left. Hey, we were dancing. We were saying, God, we didn't expect the answer to come that quick. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? We are like, ah, we didn't expect the answer to come that quick. She left. And there was peace and prosperity. In the land. I mean, it made a big difference. But guess what? A few months after, we found out that the pillar in the church has fallen in love with the caterpillar. Pillar was in love with what? Caterpillar. Because pillar holds up, caterpillar pulls down. That's why compatibility is important in marriage. It's not anybody you can marry. Don't let anybody fool you. It's not anybody you can marry. It's like saying anybody can play any role in a company when there's vacancy, employ anybody. Don't you see how specific companies are about sometimes age range, um, skill set, um, location, different things, um, qualification. I can't you can play anybody to do anything. No. Especially when it's a high-level job. It usually requires a certain level of skill. So, Pilar fell in love with what? Caterpillar. And we tried to tell him, both in English language and sign language, <laughs> that you can't marry these guys. <laughs> we told him. We tried to talk him out of it. Directly and indirectly. That you can't marry this girl. It won't work. Oh, but he was too far gone emotionally. That's why real marriage is not an emotional decision. I wish if there's something you can get today, please understand. A real solid marriage is not an emotion. The first marriage in scripture was not emotional. It wasn't that God saw that Adam was lonely. And he said, I'll make for him a lover. Or a companion. No, he said, I'll make for him a help meet. That word meet means suitable, a helper that is suitable and adaptable and complementary. So it's a fit. So choosing somebody is not about how you feel, it's about how they fit. Did you get that? Choosing a spouse is not about how you feel, it's about how they fit. So, they started dating, started a relationship. From when they started the relationship, his life began to go down. Business began to struggle. Remember, he used to pay tight weekly, so we knew when business began to struggle. Business began to struggle. He went back to fighting. Because many times she will look for trouble in places that we have to go defend her. See, when you marry somebody, it's two destinies joining together. This is why it's not an emotional decision. Two destinies. So you inherit all assets and liabilities. If they have demons, those demons are coming to your house. If they have weaknesses, you are, you are marrying those weaknesses. If they have flaws and tendencies, you are, you are inheriting everything. It's not an emotional decision. I wish the whole world can understand that. It's not an, there are rules to love. There's even what love is. I have a book here titled, Come on, Love Lies, that can stop you from finding true love. Many people think love is just a feeling. There are rules to love. There are common love lies the world has told. Movies and music have told people. See, the musicians and the movie producers are not counselors. They are not interested in your long-term welfare. They want to sell movies. And they know romance sells. So what they are telling you is not the truth of what love is. They are just selling romance. That's why you notice that no matter the movie, there must be love inside. Have you noticed? Even in a horror movie. <laughs> Even in King Kong, the girl began to fall in love. King Kong began to fall in love with the girl. Did you know? I mean, if you watch King Kong, the King Kong began to like the girl. Even in a war movie, you see the American soldier, he would like a Vietnamese girl. They are selling movie. They are not telling you the truth. So they, they have painted the picture of love at first sight. Two people just walk. They just both pick something. Then their eyes just jam. <laughs> then they play the Indian movie. <laughs> no! No! There is nothing like love at first sight. I dealt with common love lies here. There are many of love lies people tell. That if, if we love each other, it will last. <laughs> love can grow and love can die. Sometimes it can even be real love, but it doesn't mean it will last. Because people have all kinds of lies they believe about love. Love at first sight. There's nothing like love at first sight. There's only attraction at first sight. 
What you have for somebody at first sight is attraction, not love. Love is a decision, it's a commitment. You can't have it at first sight. But you can be attracted to somebody at first sight. And guess what? Just because you get married doesn't mean you will still not be attracted to another person. You can't just another love lie they tell you. That if it's love, you can't cheat. <laughs> I laugh in Spanish. That has nothing to do with it. Cheating is an act of indiscipline. It has nothing to do with love. So somebody can love you and cheat properly. All kinds of love lies. Please get this book. I dealt with the love. There are many love lies. So love at first sight is not true. You can be attracted at first sight. And attraction is not even just physical. That's the last thing the world teaches. You see, what happens to the world is that they have, in a movie, they have a short time to tell you a, a, a real truth. There's no way they can give you the, gist, the full story. So they give you in pictorial form. And that picture now enters your brain like it's true. So for instance, how many of you have watched movies where they try to act something in the Bible? Whenever they try to act something in the Bible, they always show a muscular guy. Because they're trying to show you strength. But in the real picture of who Samson is, he wasn't muscular at all because his strength was supernatural. If he had muscle, then that's not supernatural. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. But the only way you can convey that in a movie, and you want to tell us that one person killed 1,000 people, the guy must look like Rambo. <laughs> he must look like Schwarzenegger, or else it would make sense to our brain. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So that's what goes on in movies. So the only love at first sight they can show you is physical. Because that's what you can really appreciate. You can't know somebody's wise immediately. But love, or attraction, sorry, can be mental. It's not only physical. There are people that you can like because they have sense. But you see, if you have, all you've watched is love at first sight physical, you will miss out on people that are not physically immediately attractive but have a lot of sense. You just see him from far, see? I don't like this guy. Talk to him first. By the first date, you might end up knowing... This is the person that will help my destiny. I'm too foolish. <laughs> Sometimes, when I read how Solomon had 700 wives and 300 babes, yes, Solomon, I understood why women were always following him. Solomon represented everything women like. He was handsome. Secondly, he was in power. Women like people in power. Thirdly, because women like security. Thirdly, he was rich. Fourthly, he came from royalty. Megan understands this. Fifth, <laughs> if you didn't get that, that's fine. Fifth, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Fifth, he had, he, had, he had a destiny in God. Women like men that have a destiny in God. So he fit into, most men don't come with all those things together. But Solomon had all of it together. Had a godly heritage, came from the seed of David. Then he was now wise. I mean, Queen of Sheba traveled miles. You see, just, she, she didn't come for her, his power because she too was a queen. She didn't come for his riches, she too was rich. She came for his wisdom. So, attraction is not just physical, but movies have no choice but to show you only physical. So, the average young girl, who do you want in a man? He must be tall. Because that's all you've seen. No, there is. That's why rich men always have the fine. Rich men at any age. An 80 year old rich man can see somebody a, a, a supermodel at 21. Because money is attractive. Very attractive. <laughs> Millions. Bentley. <laughs> Castle is attractive. Private jet. Attractive. But all movies show you is physical love. The first time I met my wife, the attraction, now it wasn't love, it was attraction. The attraction wasn't physical because the place was dark. <laughs> <laughs> I and my classmates, because she, was, she also went to the same secondary school with us, I and my classes went to her house where a few of us, like five or six or ten, I can't remember, went to her house. It was dark, it was in the, late in the evening, and there was no light. So she came out to greet all of us, so I couldn't see her. And she said, thank God I didn't even see her because she just losing her hair that day. Women understand, when you're just losing braids or something, you know how your hair looks. And she was wearing, um, a, 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 like, her dad's um, gown, like this jalabiya that, you know, Muslims wear, the gown. So she was shapeless, uh, hair was scattered, she wasn't looking like it, but, so I couldn't see her, basically. But as we were talking in that, all of us were just gisting, she made one or two comments, I said, this girl is witty. I like how she thinks, she's smart. So that was where my interest started. I didn't see her, I heard her. 
when you're a skilled hunter. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you don't have to see the antelope before you get ready to shoot. Sometimes by hearing the footsteps, you know something good is coming. So, love or attraction is not always physical. Don't fall for that. Sometimes it's spiritual attraction. There are many people that are in love with a worship minister or a preacher. What you love is the fact that he's spiritual. Are you getting what I'm saying? You don't even know him. Sometimes you are in love with the preacher. You think, because you think this is how he is at home. There's a difference between the guy at home and the guy on the stage. Oh, I wish some ladies can understand what I'm saying. One mommy, Gio, came to church Sunday morning and sat on the altar. They said, mommy, what's wrong? She said, I want to marry the pastor. They said, you're already married to the Gio. He said, no, I want the one on the stage. He said, the one at home and the one on the stage are not the same. The one on the stage is funny, he's witty, he's nice, he's kind, he's spiritual. He said, the one at home is mean. So because the, the me on the stage, when you see a music minister, you love his way, he sings, oh my, oh, and you say, oh, I love him, oh, the voice. He doesn't sing like that at all. What women are thinking is that when we get home, everything he says, he will sing it. <laughs> Can I have my food? <laughs> he will ad lib to ask for food. <laughs> no. It's not, that's not the same person. Are you here, somebody? Please, get the book, Come on, Love Lies. Even I even have another one here on love that talks about how to know if he or she really loves you. When people say, oh, you don't know, you can know when you are being scammed. That's it, there are rules and guidelines to everything. There's a way to know if a guy loves you. There's a way to know if a girl loves you. And it's two books in one, so if you buy one, you get another one free. There are one, two sides. How to know if she really loves you. How to know if he really loves you. I give seven points each. There's how to know if a girl loves you. Guys, let me tell you, women don't want dating, they want marriage. For many women, until you marry them, they are still in the market. Ladies don't laugh too much, they don't know. <laughs> Most guys don't know, women have options, they keep their options open. Until you marry them, they are still in the market. You come and use your own delay and delay them. <laughs> now date them for seven years. <laughs> women don't want, the men don't know. Women don't want dating. So this is your perpetual dating a girl. She's checking, keeping her options open. Many women meet their husband while they are dating another person. I'm preaching. I'm talking to the wrong church today. Many women meet their real husband when they're dating another person. One person is just delaying them, dating them, dating. One guy comes and his tone is different, his body language is different, everything is different. She will just marry him. Why she's dating you? One of my boys told me how his girlfriend broke up with him two months after he saw a wedding date. You think they just met two months ago? You were interested in dating. She saw somebody interested in marriage. So there's a way to know if a woman loves you. I listed seven things here. There's a way to know if a guy really loves you. If a guy is talking and he doesn't include you in the, in the plans, he's saying, I plan to. Next year, I plan to. Three years from now, I plan to. <laughs> he doesn't love you. He's marking time. <laughs> a guy that loves you, you'll be hearing, we will. We will. He will start asking you about important things about the future. He will include you in the decision making. And he will practically take those steps. Not that he's just saying it from out. At least seven things they will help you. How to know if he or she. So there are many good books here. Let me finish this story. Then I will talk to my people a bit more. So how to know if he or she loves you. So the caterpillar, the pillar married the caterpillar. <laughs> so the pillar married the caterpillar back into church. <laughs> yes, now. Nah. When they married, she has to come back. So she came back. Our miracle didn't last that long. So she came back to church and she continued from where she stopped. <laughs> Fighting continued, trouble continued. So before long, she left church again after a few months. Then he was still coming, but after a while, he also now left. I didn't see them again for like four years. So when I met him four years after, his own testimony, this is not somebody said, me and him sat down to talk. He said, Pastor, that marriage had failed from day one. He said, the reason why it even lasted four years was because we, we were trying to prove you wrong. We didn't want it to look like you warned us and we entered and we failed. That it had failed from the work. We were just patching it so that it wouldn't be like. Because we were trying to prove you wrong. That's why I made it to four years. It failed from the one. He said they fought every day. And that's what we told him. She's a fighter. Marriage doesn't change people. It amplifies their character. 
If he's insulting you now, he will slap you when you're in marriage. If he's lying to you now, he will even frame you <laughs> for murder in marriage. <laughs> marriage doesn't change people. Stop thinking you will marry someone and change them. Stop thinking they will get better. The way marriage works is that you must say you hope they will get better, but if they remain as is, you'll be happy with it. That's how marriage works, because they might never change. In fact, if there's even most likely change, sometimes it can be changed for the worse. If they were calling you three times, they might not call you again. If they were cooking for you, they might not cook again. If they were supporting you, they might not. So you must write to say, if this guy doesn't get better, or if this girl doesn't get better, will I be happy for the rest of my life with this? So, they were fighting like that. He said, there are times he almost threw her from the balcony. So they fought that much. That there's no restaurant or fast food they went to that they didn't fight there. That she'll fight the valet or fight the people opening the doors, fight the people selling the food. She will fight everybody. That there are times they'll be driving in the road, on the road and they'll, come, they'll park the car on the highway, come down, fight. His own testimony. They'll come down, fight, then straighten their clothes back. I enter the car and continue driving. Character. Character. Second C. Third C. Please marry your friend. Companionship. Marry your friend. People don't understand that the thing that holds a marriage the most is friendship. Marry your friend. Very important. Marry your friend. Marriage is two friends living together. It's not even two lovers. Nobody can be lovers all day. But you can be friends all day. Nobody, butterfly, say butterfly in my stomach. Butterfly has a short lifespan. <laughs> Check how many days butterflies live. But when somebody, say hey, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Say the friend is there for you at all times. Friendships last longer than romance. So companionship, marry your friend. I don't have time to go into that. Let's go to the last thing I'll talk about before we close today. I've talked about being the right person. I've talked about what? Choosing the right person. <laughs> I forgot to talk. All the single men in the house, can I hear an amen? amen. Ah, all the single men in the house, can I hear an amen? amen. Only three of you, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a guy in the house, please, there's a book here titled Seven Qualities Wise Men Want. I discovered that most men don't know the qualities they need in a wife. Most men pick their wife on the spur of the moment. Every time I've counseled men in crisis marriages, by the way, they love men in crisis marriages. They just don't talk as much as women. Women complain more. They love men suffering, but they don't talk. They use work to deflect. They love men are suffering. And every time I counsel these men, I always ask them, so how did you pick your wife? And 99% of the time without fail, I would hear things like, I was just in church. She came up to stage to sing, and something told me, <laughs> that's your wife. Or I was somewhere, she just passed, and I told myself, this is my wife. That's it. Men just pick at the spur of the moment. As a guy, you need to even know the qualities you need to know the kind of person to pick. Most guys don't even know their own needs. They think if I just marry, if I, as long as I have money, I'll be okay. No. And unfortunately, because some men have picked randomly like that and it looks to be working, most men think that's the right principle. No. When you are marrying someone, you are inheriting their whole personality, not just their looks. That's why the Bible says, beauty fades. Say, charm is deceitful. It's a woman that fears the Lord shall be praised. God was warning men that don't follow beauty. Don't follow how she makes you feel. Look for a woman that fears the Lord. That takes time to know her character. Physical attraction is okay, but that's not what determines who you marry. Everywhere in scripture, God, God contrasts physical attraction and the internal qualities. Most people don't want to, just want to choose physically. So, men, there are qualities you need. I'll mention one. I listed seven in this book. I'll mention one. Guys, listen, one of your major needs. Not one, so needs is peace of mind. Men, you need peace of mind. Women don't need peace of mind. <laughs> Ladies, stay out of this. I'm talking to guys. <laughs> now, women want peace of mind. Oh, yes. Women want peace of mind. They don't need it. Women can thrive in chaos. Men don't know this. The person you are dealing with can thrive in chaos. Why? Not, that, not, not because she likes chaos, but her capacity. A woman's brain like a seven-lane highway. The thing you are calling stress, she's calling it discussion. 
Her capacity is amazing. She, I mean, I mean, they, 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 they put machines on the man and the woman having a serious argument. They found out the man's heart rate went to 99.9. Um, the man's blood pressure, everything went high. The man couldn't cope. Most times when there's a serious argument between a man and a woman, what does the man do? He leaves the place. He's not leaving just because he wants to leave. He can't cope. <laughs> so most times the guy wants to exit. Because if he doesn't go, he will explode. A lot of times it leads to domestic violence if he doesn't leave. His heart rate can't cope with it. He has to leave. When he's trying to leave, what's the woman usually saying? You are not going. <laughs> because that thing stressing him out is not stressing her out. They put the same machines on the woman. Heated argument. Her heart rate was the same before, <laughs> during, and after. Same. She would say, why are you going? We are not quarreling. We are just talking. She can drive in chaos. Her capacity is amazing. Her emotional capacity, her mental capacity, not the same as yours at all. You, you are so, your own capacity is so small. You can't handle stress. That's why mental stress. But she can. She can have that long argument. And she will even enjoy, she will even feel better. Say, huh, I even feel better. <laughs> we have all shared our mind now. She feels better. And you, you are so confused because you don't even know what the argument was about. So, as a man, and again, on that reason why you terribly need peace of mind is how your brain is wired. Your brain thinks deeply but slowly. So, you need serenity to think. She thinks on her feet, like I said earlier on. So, she doesn't need everywhere to be quiet for her to think. In fact, she can be talking to somebody, taking care of the kids, cooking, and still be thinking. If you leave a man to do all those three things, he will burn the food, and he will call the wife to ask, how many children did you leave here when you were going? I can only see two. Did you take the other third one with you? I can't remember. Because his mind is not that complex. So the person you are dealing with is not the same. So as a man, peace of mind. And again, as a man, peace of mind for you. If a man is thinking from here and he wants to project his life to where that speaker is and he's thinking, oh, I want to do some certifications, have to do this. He's thinking of how to get there. If he thinks and thinks and thinks and gets to this place and you interrupt him, <laughs> he has to come back here. That's how slowly his mind works. But women think on their feet. So you can't, you can't, you can't marry a woman that stresses you out, that is always arguing with you. You're explaining simple things to her. She's not, I said I don't agree. I said I don't agree. You're gonna, you, she's going to literally make you fail in life because you're always stressed. The man needs that peace and calmness to dig deep. That's why if you marry right, your life will clearly go forward. If you marry wrong, your life will clearly stay the same or go backward. As a guy, who you marry impacts you. She can think on her feet. She can think with do three things. My wife is always very annoying. We are watching movie, movie date. She's watching the movie, she's answering chat, and she's playing game. I say, are you watching the movie or are you playing? She say, I'm watching. Then me, I'm concentrating. But I'm not hearing everything they're saying. I say, what is this? <laughs> with all those things, she's one telling me this is what they said. That's, how, that's the capacity of person you're dealing with. You as a man, your brain, your brain is very one-track minded because your core function as a man is vision. Guys, if you are single or married, this is one thing you must always have. If you are praying, this is what you should pray for. Vision. Your four, when you say you are the head, where, where is the eyes? It's the head. Your real job as a man is vision. A woman's real job is to incubate. If you have no vision to give her to incubate, if she has nothing to do with her energy, she will give you stress. Many women are stressing their husband because the husband has not given them something to do. Give her something to worry about. If, you do, if she doesn't have something to worry about, she'll worry about you. Where are you? Why are you not home? Give her seven kids. <laughs> she won't have time to say, so She won't remember you. <laughs> if somebody goes, are you getting what I'm saying? As a man, your core function is vision, seeing the future. That's the number one thing you must have. Even ladies, this is what you should look out for in a man a man of vision. Where are we going as a family? Where are you going? That's what you should have. And that's how God created you. That's why you can't multitask. Because one of the ways God protects vision is focus. If you multitask like a woman, you will never be focused. Your core function, a woman is given the gift of multitasking because her own strength is details. She can do more than one thing well. So she can support your vision, support her own vision, support any vision. She can do, but you as a man, God protects your ability for vision through focus. Men's problem, all men's problem comes from their eyes. 
Men have more nerves in their eyes than women do. David's life was going very smoothly until he saw a woman having a bath. His life changed forever. But Job was wiser. Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I will not be looking left and right. If you want to live well as a man, you must guard your eyes. That's how you do it. Guard your eyes. And women, on the other hand, are given the ability to see more than one thing. That's why a man's call for, scientifically, they found out that men can see better on a straight line than women can. Women can see better by the side. But men can see better on a straight line. Women don't see well on a straight line. But they can see around them. Because the first men were hunters. They need to be able to look at the antelope no matter how far. The first women were nurturers and gatherers. They can have three children playing here. They are looking straight, but they can see the three children and make sure they are safe. That's how God wired it. That's why most men don't know that women can see from the corner of their eyes. Guys, anytime you are sitting by your wife or your fiancé and you are pressing your phone, she's reading your chat. <laughs> most guys don't know. She's looking at the TV with you, but she's reading your chat, so you are going out by four. <laughs> to Stylus Cafe. Who, do you, who are you going to see? She's reading the chat. The chat is reading the chat. She's looking like this. She can see from the corner of her eyes. Most men don't know that. A lot of time, a guy thinks you enter a room. Say, I just saw one fine girl. No, she saw you first. The difference is that when you are looking at a woman, you look into your eyes. <laughs> she can see you. But she, she's looking straight at the preacher, but she has scanned the room. There are they single men here? Are they fine men here? There are some fine men here. Look at her. Sometimes you see two girls sitting together. They are gossiping a guy on that side. Say, see that guy? I like his beard. He's looking at us. He's smiling. I think he wants to come here. They are... <laughs> women are scoping the room they've seen you before you saw them anytime I travel and I go to places like Walmart or any big store like that and two Africa, an African couple enters and man and woman I usually know when the woman has seen me because women recognize me first so they are in a store, she's looking at the chef and she has seen me and she starts doing her face in a certain way, I know she's talking about me she's saying, is this that person that comes on TV and she's looking, she's looking and she's talking to her husband now she's able to look at me without she turning her face but I know that this man will soon spoil this gossip. <laughs> the moment she tells the man, is that Pastor Kingsley? The man will just turn. Where? Yeah. <laughs> I will now wave to him that I'm, I'm the one. It's me. <laughs> He's going to spoil the gossip. Any married woman here that has gossip with her husband, you know that men will spoil the gossip. You say, don't look, don't look. Say, where, where, where? Where should I not look? <laughs> oh my God. Because women can see from the corner of their eyes. Their roles involve diversity. Their roles involve details. And sometimes, ladies, because you come with the gift of details, it comes with the challenge of pettiness. Because when you have the gift of details, you are seeing things you should see and things you should not see. That's the challenge. So you have to discipline yourself. Men don't have the gift of details. If a room is scattered and a man can find one line on his bed to sleep, the whole bed is scattered, though. He can find one line, he will sleep there. Because details don't disturb him. The fact that the room is scattered, he can, he can keep his mind on this one line. But if a woman enters a room that is scattered, she usually can't rest until she arranges the room. Because the details are entering. Women see too many details. That's why for men, blue is blue. For women, blue is not blue. There's powder blue, turquoise blue, ocean blue, sky blue, blue, blue. Because she's picking details. She knows the difference. Men don't have those kind of details. It's something I'm saying. And as a woman, because you have the challenge of pettiness, and you also have the grace for fixing things, if you are not careful, you will keep focusing on what's not done instead of what's working. This is why many women nag their husbands forever. The man will think, okay, she has said we don't go on date. That's what she's complaining about. If I start going on date, she will stop complaining. No, she will not. Once she's not going on there, she will jump to the next thing that is not done. So she needs to train herself to know that I have to stop complaining. And don't wait until everything is perfect before you are happy. Because your instinct as a fixer is to keep looking for what to fix. When you enter a room, you don't look for what's working. You look for what's not working. When you see a man, you don't look for what's working. You look for what you can work on. So that makes you a naga if you're not careful. That makes you a complainer. So you have to discipline yourself to start looking at the positive, not the negative. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So men, peace of mind. And my professor, most of you know the guy, um, he's one of my mentors in family life coaching. 
He's renowned, respected, even Harvard and Co. respects him. Um, all his books have been bestsellers for every year for over 100 years, 1,000 years. Bestseller back to back to back. If I mention his name, all of you will know him. Well respected. Professor, he's a professor emeritus, retired. Professor emeritus Solomon David. In the Bible, don't you know him? He's <laughs> a best-selling professor. Because he researched having 1,000 women. 700 wives, 300 babes. Not in digital age. He was dating them manually. <laughs> no video call, no WhatsApp call, no Zoom, no, no FaceTime. Manually. That means if he sees one today, there are 365 days a year. 1,000 women. If he sees one today, he says, thank you, Julia. It was nice seeing you. Your next appointment, August 16, 2025 or 26. How do you even remember their names, 1,000 women? But you see, after 1,000 women, Solomon came up with some theories. He said, if you marry a contentious woman, you go and live in the corner of the roof. If you marry a troublesome woman, you go and live in the wilderness. He was just pointing again to the fact that a man can't function with stress. How did he know this? If you see some of his proverbs and this thing, there are some times you know he's writing wisdom. Some other times he's just writing rubbish. <laughs> because somebody was stressing him. Vanity upon vanity, all is vanity. <laughs> This life is useless. We are all foolish. <laughs> Somebody was stressing him. He was writing rubbish at that time. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, if you're a wise man, please get the book. Seven qualities wise men want. If you're a wise woman, I have one for you. Seven questions wise women want. I mean, seven questions wise women ask. If you're a wise woman in the house, please ask seven questions you must ask. And even if you're here, you're married already, these books are good for you to learn so that you can teach. Because all of us, we cancel somebody one day. Either your siblings, your brother, your children, your parents, you will cancel somebody. Seven questions once women. Women ask the best questions when they are not in love. Once a woman is in love, she doesn't know what to ask. Women, these are seven questions you must ask a guy. Not like interview questions, but there are seven questions you must get answers to. One of them is when. Of course, apart from what, please always ask what. A lot of men that claim that men broke their heart, the man never broke your heart. He said, I want to date you. That's, he defined it, and he dated you for seven years. He said, thank you for dating you. Now you are outdated. He said he was going to date you. Did he lie? Did he not date you? So always be clear about the what. Don't let somebody drag you into an unclear what. Then the next thing after the what is when. You want to marry me? When? The timing matters. Because his timing might not work with your timing. Men don't have the same relationship with time that women do. Women, from when you start seeing your menstrual cycle, your time, you're on the clock. A man has no biological clock. He has only financial clock. This is why teachers don't go on strike for doctors. And doctors don't go on strike for truck drivers. Everybody strike for themselves. So when you enter a relationship, look out for yourself first. Don't work with his timing. Work with your timing. Don't work with her timing. Work with your timing. Everybody should protect their own interest and come to an agreement or a compromise. Left to a man, he can marry at 50. He has no hurry. He's working with financial clock. When does he want to marry? He after I have three houses, bringing me rental income. You as a woman, you want three children. You must work at a time that works for both of you. He has no biological clock. A man can have children at any age. I used to have an uncle that was this high. My knee side, my uncle. Your father's brother is your uncle, right? Yes, my uncle was like this. <laughs> because my grandfather, his first wife died. He now married at old age. He was in his 70s or thereabout. He now married again and gave back to one of my uncles. <laughs> like this. I used to carry him with respect. <laughs> carry my uncle with respect. My uncle. If we line up to pick meat in the village, we have to line up behind him. It's our uncle. Because men can have kids at any age. That's my point. Men can start a family at any age. As a woman, you can't start a family at any age. Don't let somebody date you perpetually. I had a friend that dated somebody for 10 years. And when the lady got tired and left, he dated another one for under 10 years. Real story. He had two tenor in government. <laughs> two term governorship. Are you here, somebody? This one, this one has a good book to help you. So let me end with the one for married folks. Doing it right. Sometimes you can pick the right person and not do the marriage right. Are you here, somebody? Sometimes you can pick the right person and what? Not do the marriage right. And this is where a lot of other people fall into. They've picked a good woman. They've picked a good man. But they're not doing the marriage right because they have never learned. 
Men and women are different. So there is a way to do Many people, you found the love of your life. Remember when you got married, you, you couldn't believe that this woman is naive enough to marry a useless man like you. <laughs> or that this man is naive enough to marry a wicked woman like you. You were so happy. You felt you had found the love of your life. Until two years after, when the romance has settled down. Listen, people get married because they love themselves, but people stay married because they like themselves. And the only way you improve your likability is by learning how to serve your partner. Love won't just work by itself. The secret to lasting love is that you must move from emotional love to intentional love. There are three stages to love. There is the emotional high, there is the emotional low, and there is the intentional emotional high. What do I mean? This is how everything in life happens. There is the automatic high, then there is the inevitable low, then there's now the intentional high. The automatic high happens with every new thing. When you first, first buy a car, when you first came to the UK, when you first knew you were coming to the UK, you were so excited, you felt you were going to heaven. <laughs> when you first got a job, when you first got admission, when you first joined the church, when you first gave your life to Christ, there was a high. When you feel like, you feel like Jesus was following you everywhere. Everything you were seeing a message in it. A boss will pass with an advert to say, that's God talking to me. <laughs> this is what I was praying about this morning and God just answered. You are seeing God in everything. Every time you open your Bible, it's as if God is speaking to your situation. Every time you pray, you feel the presence of God. You feel this is going to be forever. A few weeks or months after that, you have to be more intentional in studying your Bible. You have to learn how to trust that God is with you even when you don't see any sign. So, if you're not ready for that, they'll be low. You think God has abandoned. And many people at that point, they backslide. They will, they will tell them now start telling them, you've lost your salvation. You had lost last week. God has left you. So, you need to grow beyond the feeling stage to the knowledge stage. Many people never grow. They want to remain in high feelings. No! The first high feeling will always go. If you join a church newly, oh, I'm a pastor for, I've been a pastor close 30 years. I've gone through this a lot of times, so I've learned. When new members come to church the first day, he say, Pastor, I'm going to die in this church. <laughs> I finally found my church. I love everything. The music, the worship, the word. This is a church. I'm going to die. He has not seen the gossip, the hatred, the manipulation. Because all that comes with it too. But usually you see the first things you want to see. Same thing with your job. You loved it when you were coming. You were always coming early. You were wondering why we were coming late. One year after, you are the one coming late. <laughs> so there is the automatic high, there is the inevitable low, then there is the intentional high. Now, this one means you now find new meaning and new knowledge for why you are doing what you are doing. In a church setting, you now find out that a church is a family. And in a family, we don't always have perfect people or perfect actions. In every family, a lot of you have some mad people in your family. If you don't know who the mad person in your family is, you are the one. <laughs> you are the one. <laughs> There's always that person that doesn't behave like part of you. You want this one? Is he, are you really my sibling? There's always that person. So you understand the family is not perfect. In the family, we tolerate each other. In the family, we give each other time. In the family, we love in spite of. In the family, when we're offended, we don't leave the family. So you have to find new meaning of what the family looks like. You have to find new meaning for why you walk where you walk. You have to find new meaning for why you do what you do. You have to find new meaning about what Christ is, what giving your life to Christ means. Same thing with your marriage. You have to now find new meaning for why you are here. What's the purpose of marriage? It's not to always make me happy. We're working as a team. We're achieving something bigger than both of us. And then you start learning about how to please your partner. Because that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says. He said, when you are single, you are focused on pleasing the Lord. But when you are married, you are focused on pleasing your partner. So you begin to learn. What are the things my partner likes? You begin to increase your likability. Remember, people marry because they love themselves, but they stay married because they like themselves. So you have to start doing some things intentionally. If you always shout at your husband and he has told you he doesn't like it, then you have to start learning how to talk to him differently. You learn how to talk to him differently. 
Are you here, somebody? So many people have married the right person, but they don't behave right. When I got married, I got married with the right heart, but I didn't have the right sense. Oh, the first few years or maybe year of our marriage, my wife was just saying I was emotionally unavailable. Because like I said, I grew up in a house of five boys. No emotional wisdom of any kind. If you grow up with five boys, there's no emotion in the house. The only woman in the house was my mom, and she was in the army. So she doesn't count. <laughs> so no emotions. Is somebody going to know what I'm saying? So I had to learn what it means to be emotional or be emotionally available or emotionally in touch. Most men are too rugged. They don't understand that women are not like men. The things that matter to women might not make sense to men. So you can't follow just your sense. You must learn wisdom. You must learn that I must do things to my partner even though it doesn't make sense. Men don't understand why women need to hear I love you all the time. Women have selective memory. If you say something bad to them, they will never forget. But the good thing you are saying to them, they always forget. So you must tell them every day. I hate you that you said 10 years ago. She will still remind you. Randomly, 10 years after. She's not cooking. There's a time you say you hate me. <laughs> 10 years ago. But the I love you, you said last week has already expired. You need to say on that one today. If you don't understand, it doesn't make sense to men. But you see, you can't always do what makes sense to you. Women don't understand sometimes what sex means to men. <laughs> I have a book <laughs> titled How to Make Love to a Woman Without Touching Her. Please, all the guys, get this. And if you're a woman, get this in advance for whoever the guy in your life is. And give him. He will need it. He needs to learn how to treat you. There's a way to make love to a woman without touching her. Men and women are in four components, but differently. A woman is first emotional, secondly spiritual, thirdly mental, lastly physical. I'll repeat that. A woman is first emotional, secondly um, spiritual, thirdly mental, lastly physical. A man is opposite that. He's first physical, secondly mental, thirdly physical, I mean, um, first physical, second mental, thirdly spiritual, lastly emotional. They are almost opposite. So if you want to talk to a woman, you must first appeal to her emotions. If you want to unbutton a woman's blouse, first unbutton her heart. She will unbutton her blouse by herself. <laughs> but most men go straight to the point. Because men are physical. They think women are physical. So you see a married man wants to do something with his wife at night. He just touches her straight. <laughs> <laughs> go straight to the point. And men don't know that that thing irritates women. <laughs> we are just lying down. You just touch me. <laughs> And you think you're a, you're a smooth guy. <laughs> women are not that physical. If you want to make love to a woman at night, how you treat her throughout the day matters. You can't leave her to take care of the kids and do all the dishes and do all the cooking and do all the grocery shopping and she's so tired and you think at night she'll be a tiger in your bed. <laughs> you'll be a mouse. She wants to sleep. <laughs> just, just, um. No. No. Women are not that physical. They're emotional. So how you treat them throughout the day? Even their body, a woman's body is 10 times softer than a man's body. So even when you want to make love to a woman, don't, you don't have such a, a major sexual organs immediately. Every part of her body is soft. So you can start with her hair, you can start with her shoulder, everywhere is okay. But men, only one part of a man has feelings. <laughs> so a man even wants to go straight to the point. If a man is walking his laptop, you now touch his hair, touch his neck. You say, you, you want anything, you are disturbing me, I'm walking. <laughs> you can see I'm walking, I'm trying to answer something. Because that's a, he doesn't understand. <laughs> but for a woman, what does not like you to go straight to the point? She wants all the other things you do before the act is part of it for a woman. She's emotional. How you talk to her, you can't be insulting her throughout the day. You can't be speaking down at her. Telling her she's a witch. Telling her she's this. Then in the night, you want her to be in the mood. One guy, God, was very angry. They came for counseling. He and his wife was very angry. I said, what happened? He said, we are about to make love. They were already even making love in the beginning. And the woman said, we need to talk. He said, now? <laughs> and he was like, oh, she was spoiling the mood. I said, no, she was not spoiling the mood. She was trying to get in the mood. Because as long as she has something pending that both of you have not resolved, she can't get in the mood. But men are different. There can be world war going on. And a man can have sex. Rent can be due. And they're going to kick you out tomorrow. And a man can have sex this night. It's totally unrelated. He's a physical being. And women don't, women don't understand. Women say, sex, sex, sex. Is that all you think about? The answer is, yes. yes. Women don't understand. Sex, sex, sex. Is it food? Yes. yes. How many women have seen the man moody? 
He said, have you, you want to eat? You have not eaten. Should I get something to eat? He's not that eating he's looking for. Because some men don't know they are busy body on the wrong thing. So don't worry, food is ready. Don't be wrong, baby. Don't be hungry now. He's not that food. He's not the one on the stove he's looking for. He's the one on the bed he's looking for. Is somebody get what I'm saying? So if you understand how they are both, women are first emotional. Talk to them emotionally. If you want to get a woman to buy into a dream, appeal to her emotions. Some men want to buy sports cars. Many men tell me, Pastor, I can't control my wife. I can't tell her things. <clears throat> I can't tell her things I want her to do. I said, no, you're not talking to her well. You want to buy a sports car as a man. You can't tell a woman, hey, I've seen one car, a 16 valve, a 750 horsepower, convertible. Where are you running to? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense to her. You want to tell her, sell her on that kind of thing. Tell her, that, baby, we've not been spending enough time together. But I've seen one car. Only two seats. Me and you. <laughs> Sundays after church, we'll just enter the car, go for a long drive. We'll drop the top, wear our dark shades, and we'll just talk about our week. She'll say, how much? <laughs> That's how to talk to a woman. You appeal first to her emotions. I'll say 16 valve, 700 horsepower. That doesn't appeal to a woman. <laughs> Is that what I'm saying? Talk to her emotion. Secondly, a woman is spiritual. Very spiritual. Women have a strong spiritual desire. That's why the average woman is involved in all kinds of online prayer, online service, online something. Sunday service is not enough for them. Throughout the week, they must join one prayer, join one thing, join one. And men don't understand. What are you always doing? Because women have a strong spiritual need. They are wired that way. That's why many men don't understand why the woman honors the pastor and doesn't honor them. Very simple. Because the pastor is missing a major need in her life. Speaking to her spiritually. But you, you don't know, all you know is 11 players of Asna. You don't even know 11 verses in the Bible. Even if you don't know so much spiritually, be excited about spiritual things. When she wants to go to church, be the one shot, are we not going to church today? Don't be the person they are dragging to go to church. You see, these are the things that improve your likability. Many people don't know why their marriage is going down. It's because you are not likable. You are doing everything opposite of what the person wants. She's spiritual, but you hate going to church. She's spiritual, you hate praying. She's spiritual, you, there is, there's no way she, of course, she will admire the worship minister or the pastor more than you. Because that guy is meeting a spiritual need in her life. That's why she respects him. But you, she can't respect you. Because she's going to struggle to do so. Because you're not even meet, trying to meet up. Now, you don't have to be a spiritual giant overnight. But start, start with the small things. Love to go to church. You can do that. It's not so hard. You can drive. Help out with the kids for church. Join a unit in your church. If you can't join a spiritual unit like prayer band, join sound. <laughs> where they carry wire. <laughs> you don't have to be a spiritual. <laughs> you understand? Just see, a woman finds you incredibly admirable when you serve in God's house. When she sees a man that just loves God, see you carry speaker. <laughs> She's seen your muscle. She said, I like this man, he loves God. Simple things that men can do. But they don't get it. You need to increase your likability. So I have, we have this book I and my wife wrote. Praying for your husband and praying for your wife. Because many marriages will make it without prayer. My wife wrote some prayer points and scriptures she prays over me. Oh, those things are working. Sometimes she will pray. She will say, as I was praying for you, I saw dollars coming out of your hand. I said, you are praying where? Continue. So she has prayer points and scriptures she prays over me. It has changed my life. I also wrote the one I pray over her, praying for your wife. Scriptures. See, men, you might not know the prayer points. I've written it here. You might not know the scriptures. I've written it here. Simple prayers can pray over your wife. There's nothing as sexy to a woman as a man that prays. Nothing as sexy. Just hug her and just repeat what I've written here. <laughs> it's prayer and you pray it over her. Very simple. If you have children, always pray over your children every day. I bless my kids before they go to school every day. Every day. I lay my hands on them. They say, by faith, Jacob laid his hands on his children and declared their future. By faith. So these are simple things you can do. So this book is important. Pray for it. And if you're a woman and your husband doesn't buy, pray for your wife. Buy the two and give him. So that you can use after you prayed for. Because women always like to pray for their husband. Men, too, you should pray for your wife. And if you don't like your husband or wife, or you don't like prayer, if you like me and Pastor Mildred, our picture is here. <laughs> you can buy it. Praise God. Increase your likability. This one is no dry season. Talks about finances. Say financial devotional. Money can rock a marriage. Mm, I was a financial wreck when we were young in marriage. Money can wreck a family. So please, this helps both of you be on the same page financially. It's a financial devotional. It will bless you. And in closing, 
yes, we still have um, all year round for men, all year round for women. These are also things that help you know what to do to your spouse every day. All year round for men, all year round for men. What we did in that book is that we coach couples. Me, I coach the men. Things, they can, things you can do every week for your husband or your wife. 52 tips for 52 weeks. That's why it's called all year round. My wife also wrote for women things you can do to love your um, husband. The last book I will speak about, A to Z of Marriage, one of our best books. All these things help your likability. There are things to do that will make you happy with your partner or your partner happy with you. A to Z of Marriage, what we did in the book is that I coach the women what love means to a man in alphabetical order, A to Z. My wife coached the women what love means to, I mean, men, what love means to a woman, A to Z. So for instance, A for the men. We told the women, A for men is acceptance. Men like acceptance. A man hustles for almost every respect he gets. One of the places he wants to be able to be accepted for who he is, is in his marriage. If a woman, the moment you have agreed to marry a man, please, one of the gifts you must give him is acceptance. I'm not talking about accepting toxic behavior, but I mean his basic flair and difference. Because a woman, you're coming with so much pictures and expectations that your husband is not. You have looked at your boss, how smart your boss is. You have looked at your pastor, how spiritual your pastor is. You have looked at your father, how rich your father is. And you are bringing that expectation to your husband. First, give him acceptance wherever level he is. Let him know you appreciate him. And that takes consciousness. Because a woman, you generally like good things. You compare things upward. Men compare things downward. A woman will say, can't you see so-and-so person? How he's doing? A man will say, can't you see so-and-so one? He's cheating on his wife with ten women. <laughs> Me, it's only one. Men compare downwards, men compare upwards. So, A for men, we told women, is acceptance. Men need acceptance. If your husband eats and makes loud noises, mwah, 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 don't come and say, you're this bushman. No. Let him know you accept him. Tell him, baby, I love that you enjoy food. Mm, the way you enjoy food, that's why I love cooking for you. See, men will listen better when they see you as an ally. Women want to change a man, but they don't know how to change a man. Women, naturally, you're a fixer. Most men don't know that. From the day a woman agrees to marry you, she has made a mental note of all the things she wants to change about you. Many men are walking about saying, she loves me the way I am. No, she doesn't. <laughs> she has a full list. She wants to change your dressing. See your dressing, I don't like it. This is your hairstyle, I will change it. Your teeth, they are not the same level, I'll file it. <laughs> she wants to change you. And women, that's not bad. The only issue is that don't force him to change. Let him see you as an ally. Don't confront a man. Women, most times, because they are impatient, they want to confront a man. You must change now. No. The moment you confront him, he will defend. Men see confrontation as an act of war. Women confront to connect. Men confront to conquer. When you come in front of a man and confront him, his natural instinct is to defend, even if you are right. Most men told me, tell me things like, I'd rather do what's wrong than allow this woman to control me. That's how men think. He's a defensive being. You don't confront him. He sees confrontation as an act of war. In the Old Testament, when two kings say we want to see face to face, what they mean is that we are going to war. Men hate confrontation. They threw chairs in a room, scattered the chairs, threw women in the room. All the women arranged the chairs facing themselves. They scattered the chairs, threw men in the room. All the men arranged the chairs side by side. Men talk better with people on their side. That's why most chairs in a pub or in a bar are one direction facing front. That's how men like it. We don't like to confront ourselves. So if a woman, you want to change a man, great. Don't confront him. Agree with him. Is he making loud noises? No, no, no. Say, I like how you enjoy food. The moment he sees you as an ally, you cannot tell him that. But you know we we'll soon have kids. They can't be eating like this all. <laughs> <laughs> you have first accepted him. He will now see sense in the rest of the thing you are going to say. But women start with the confrontation. Then he will see no sense even when you are making sense. Because he has, he's already defensive. Always agree first. Especially when it's reasonable to agree, okay? Always agree first. Your husband comes to you and says, baby, let's sell our house and buy crypto. And buy Bitcoin. Don't tell him you're a useless man. You're a fool. <laughs> what kind of stupid idea? No. If he tells you that, say, hey, baby, you're a business guru. <laughs> I like how you're thinking out of the box. This, this is why I like you. You're a businessman. You'll be very happy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> then at night, go and pray. Say, oh God, this man must not make us homeless. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> pray at night and the next day, do some research on the topic. I always appeal to men's logic, not their emotions. Women, because they're emotional, want to appeal to a man's emotion. Mm -mm, appeal to his logic. Don't go and tell him, don't sell the house, you will make us homeless. <laughs> it won't make him change. Next day, tell him that you've even researched that crypto thing. That some experts are also saying that it's not the best time to buy. That the market is still too volatile. But it's a great idea, and you are still willing to go with whatever he thinks. The moment he sees you are not a threat, 
Even him, by the next two weeks, he will forget that he wants to sell. He's no more. But when you want to confront him, he will now, he will just not be telling you things. Most women don't know. I have a YouTube, I have a YouTube message, a video on my YouTube channel, why your man is not talking to you. Many women that come to me, my husband doesn't talk. You are a part of most of it. Most times men are scared to talk to you because you, of how you react. And most times when he tells you something, you will prove him right by how you react. I tell women in that video, if a man comes and tells you, anything he tells you, don't overreact. No matter what the man tells you, men struggle with talking. So if he tells you anything, don't overreact. If he tells you, I kill three people. Don't say, ah, you're a murderer, you're a killer. Just ask him, where did you bury them? <laughs> as calmly as you can. He will go and show you where he buried them. When you get there, you find out it's not three people, it's seven people. <laughs> Men never tell you the full story. He wants to see how you handle the first one. And most of time, you prove him right why he should not tell you more. No matter what he tells you, always act calm. Later, you can throw, you can lose your cool later. But at that time, always act calm. He will tell you more. So, if he tells you, oh, just tell him, oh, but uh, you've studied about it, though. It might not be good to buy crypto now, but you are still okay to the idea, you know, let's just think about it. The moment he sees you are not opposing him, he can even forget. But if you don't, if you resist him, you're a fool, useless man. You will never say this. You'll just be cooking one day in your house. You'll see people inspecting your house. So how many rooms are these? <laughs> how many rooms did he say? <laughs> because he, he has gone to talk to his useless friends. And they're encouraging him to do nonsense. Are you here, somebody? So, A for men is what? Acceptance. A for women is attention. We taught the men. A for women is attention. If you are going to marry a woman, one thing you must give her is attention. You can't marry her and not have time for her. If women do everything they do for attention. Their hair is longer for attention. Their clothes are tighter. Their clothes are brighter. They want attention. She will spend hours making her hair or making her nails or looking good and you don't notice. She comes back from work. You're on your phone and you don't even look up. You say, hey, welcome. What are we eating this afternoon? <laughs> Keep your phone down and look at her. Women need to know that they are important. A woman doesn't need all of your attention. She just needs your full attention. I'll repeat that. A woman doesn't need all of your attention. She just needs what? Your full attention. What does that mean? If she comes back from work, that first 10 minutes, 15 minutes, she drop whatever you're doing and give her attention. She doesn't need your attention 24 hours. But that short time, she needs to know there's nothing else important in this world as her. When you fill up her attention tank, she will free you to go and watch your match or do whatever you want to do. But many of you, don't, you never give her full attention, so she's chasing you around the house, trying to distract you at every opportunity. Because she's trying to get... See, you must understand that every time your spouse is fighting you, they are always asking for a legitimate need. They might be asking the wrong way, but they are genuinely trying to meet a need. She's trying to talk to you, trying to avoid her. That rat race will continue for hours. Just stop and talk to her. Some quarrel in the house is not about the topic. She's just looking for attention. Since you won't talk to me willingly, you talk to me by quarrel. Letter R, we told the women, R for men is respect. Men love respect. Always speak to a man respectfully. You can tell, get a man to do anything if you tell him respectfully. R for men is respect. Men react to respect. When the Bible says women should respect men, it's not because God is trying to be patriarchal or support men. God is teaching women how men respond. Men respond to respect. Men do everything they do for respect. So the tone, the timing, the way you tell him what you tell him is more important than what you're telling him. But many women, when their blood is hot, they want to say it anyhow. I tell women, the more important the topic is, the less emotional you should be when you're telling him. Wait till your emotion is calm before you discuss it. Many times, this is why the man is not hearing you, is that you're bringing all your emotional weight on the conversation, and he can't handle it, don't forget. He shields both the information and the emotion. Wait till you are calm. I have that discussion calmly, respectfully. There's a woman in the Bible we call the unforgettable woman. Her name is Abigail. David was going to kill her family. She intercepted David on the way. She knelt down to call David Lord ten times in one conversation. David had never been respected like that before. David fell in love instantly. Followed her on all social media. <laughs> the moment her husband died, a few weeks after, David slid into her DM. <laughs> and married her a few weeks after. Even though he had a wife at home that was disrespecting him, but he had never seen a woman respect him so much. Always speak to a man respectfully. It's a major love language for men. And women make the mistake of thinking, I will only respect my husband when he's behaving respectfully. No. You will get him to behave respectfully by respecting him. Don't speak down at men. Even when he's behaving wrongly, his respect you used to correct it. Not disrespect. Women think it's disrespect. If you, are, if you don't respect yourself, me too, I will not respect you. It doesn't work for men. 
it can work for women, not for men. If you tell a woman she's not good enough, she does everything within her power to prove you wrong. If you tell a man he's not good enough, he does everything with his power to prove you right. If you tell a man you're a useless man, I say, ah, I will show you how useless I am. <laughs> it doesn't motivate you. So always speak to him with respect. R for women is romance. Women love romance. You can't marry a woman and not be romantic. And for guys, it doesn't come to most of us naturally, but you have to learn it. Women like romance. They've lived all their life in a romantic fantasy. Your job is not to remove it, but to fulfill it. And romance is not hard. It's doing the simple things in a special way. Normal things you were going to do, just make it special. You want to buy her perfume. Don't just call her, maybe I'm at the store. Which one do you like, Givenchy or Gucci? That's boring. The normal things you were going to do, just make it special. You want to buy her perfume. Buy the perfume without telling her. Wrap it. Bring, hide it somewhere she will see it. Either in a bag, in the kitchen, in, in a car. One day she'll be doing something. She'll just see something wrapped. And there'll be a small note on it. I know you will find it the way I found you. Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. It's ordinary perfume. But you are making it special. Hallelujah. Many years ago, I was going to fly my wife for her birthday. I've been telling her since when we were single. Because, you know, when I say romance, people think it's about money. No, you don't have to have money to start it. One of the first gifts I bought my wife was a phone. She was, we, she was, we were still dating then. She was doing her master's. And she was saying that, oh, her phone was bad, her phone was bad. Now, she wasn't pressuring me to buy a phone. But usually, if a guy loves you, he doesn't see your need and ignore it. So I began to look for a way. Ah, now, I couldn't afford a brand new phone. I couldn't even afford a fairly used phone. I could only afford an unfairly used phone. <laughs> you know unfairly used phones? Now you buy the phone separate, buy the charger separate, <laughs> buy the pack separate. All the numbers on the phone are not even showing. But I bought the phone. But I didn't go there and say, hey, baby, just manage your, you know, things. I said, guy, don't ever talk like that in your life. Don't ever go and tell a woman, manage your things. No, don't, don't. You're announcing the wrong news. You're reading the wrong news. A woman is looking for what to believe. Don't go and state the obvious. Say, don't worry. No, you don't have money. She can see you don't have money. <laughs> what she can't see is how things are going to be. That's your job as the head. Set vision. Many men are going to describe the obvious. She's already doubting whether she should marry you. This man that doesn't have money. Should I go ahead? Then you come and they give you a chance to make your manifesto. To make your speech. And what you come to announce is that we don't have money. <laughs> you have killed the small faith in our hearts. Because faith comes by what? Yeah. Come there and tell her how things are going to be. That's what I did to my wife. I've been telling her when we're dating that I'm going to fly you around the world. I've never seen her for that time. I said, I'll fly you business class around the world. Am I not doing it now? <laughs> That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> 22 cities in the world in one year. But I told her all this at the beginning when I'm not seeing airports. That's how to talk, guys. Don't go say, you manage, you know that things are not. No! She can see you're broke. Only you can be broke and not know how to talk. Only you. <laughs> you can't have those two problems at the same time. You can be broke, but please don't have to talk. Talk about your future. If your present is not pleasant, talk about your future. Nobody can argue with your future. It's your future. I didn't say it's today. <laughs> Nobody can argue. It doesn't come. Wait, let's wait for it. So talk big. Talk about what God is showing you. So I didn't just, I didn't go and present the phone. No, no, no. Went to a show. She went to use the bathroom. I opened her bag, brought out her old phone, changed the SIM card, put the new one I bought, the unfairly useful. So she got to her hostel at night. Something was ringing from her bag. She said, that's not my phone, but I said, it's your bag. Open it. She opened it and saw that I changed her phone. And it was James Bond ringtone. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. She was more happy about the way I delivered the gift than the fact that it's unfairly used. Be romantic. Be creative. So those days, I was going to, I've been telling her to fly out to U.S. business class. We have never seen airport. We have never flown business class. We've never even had the American visa. So finally, many years into the marriage, we finally got the U.S. visa. Her birthday was approaching. And I knew that she loved Joyce Meyer. And Joyce Meyer was having a conference in the U.S. same period as her birthday. And I wanted to fly her for that Joyce Meyer conference. Surprise. So I just told her, that, hey, baby, you want to pick. Pastor said I should go and pick somebody at the airport. Come and follow me. She said, ah, why, why are they sending you to the airport? I said, they couldn't get another person to go, so I have to go. So she just followed me reluctantly to the airport. We got there and I said, we're not picking anybody. I'm flying to America business class today. But she said, I've not packed. I bought her my debit card. I said, you will buy everything. You buy everything on the trip. <laughs> Hallelujah. And women love shopping. So she bought everything. Be romantic. 
be cre- the normal things you were going to do. Just make it special. Don't just be boring and too serious. That which kind of romance. Don't you know the economic situation of the country? Thank you, Minister of Economics. Be romantic. When we gave back to our second child, I carried her and the first child and some people to America, rented the house for them where they were going to stay near the hospital and all that, and I was going back to Nigeria. And she said, hey, baby, are you going to come back before I put to bed? I said, no, you know, I'll be, I'll be busy with church. I won't be able to come back. Now I knew I was going to come back. But I couldn't give her dates. See our master, Jesus Christ. He says he's coming back. He has not given us dates, you know. <laughs> Resemble your father. <laughs> Resemble your father. So I didn't give her dates. I just said, I don't I won't come back. Now I knew I was going to come back. So one Sunday after church, I just called her. Hey, baby, I won't be available on the phone because I'm going power bike riding. And she understands if I'm riding back, I'm going to pick phone. She said, okay, it's fine. I wasn't riding back. I jumped on the plane, flew to America. Got people to take her out of the house, entered the parlor and sat down. And she came back, opened the house, and saw me in the parlor, sitting down. And she kept touching me throughout the one week. Don't be sure it's me. <laughs> Same, you just, not that. I'm coming next week, cook a goosey soup, cook this. No. Women like some drama, some suspense. If you know what's going through their life, you understand that a lot is going on. Surprise them, distract them from the stress of life. It's, some men tell me that, why is my wife always difficult? I say women are not trying to be difficult. They are difficult. I tell men, have you had monthly period before? Where your hormones are upside down? Have you worn, uh, 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 you know, some, some men, you see some women walking, say, she's so elegant. There are many things holding her together. <laughs> have you worn those things before? She's walking like this. Oh, I like this lady, she's so elegant. There are pillars. <laughs> she has tightened herself, she can't laugh well. <laughs> it's difficult to be a woman. Have you, have you, have you worn high heels before? And all your ankles are paining. You put saying, you're looking so nice, but you can't wait to take it off. You have slippers in the bag already. <laughs> it's difficult. Have you one hot wig in the hot sun and you can't scratch it before? <laughs> so a woman's life is really difficult. Your own is to make it easy. And please, there's this book as I close today. It's called Love Letters to Mildred. I wrote it some years ago for my wife on her birthday. I wrote about 12 or 13 things that made me marry her. I wrote it in form of love letters. If you're a guy, you will learn how to pick a wife. If you already have a wife, you will learn how to appreciate the good things about her. If you're a single lady, you will learn the qualities you should have. If you're a married lady, you also learn the qualities you should have as a woman that will make your husband always happy. Now, if you just like gossip too, a lot of pictures that are not available anywhere is here. Like the first gift I ever bought for my wife, the first gift ever, the picture is here. And a lot of interesting things, a lot of good pictures. So it's a good book to get. Love letters to me that everybody should get it. And it will be a blessing. Let me hand where you blessed this evening.